Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's session called Towards Automatic Satellite Collision Avoidance, Making Use of Artificial Intelligence. My name is Tatiana, and I will be the moderator of this session. First, first of all, on behalf of GMB, let me thank you all for your attendance here today. Before starting, I want to take this previous moment to ask you if uh, you hear me correctly. So please uh, let me know if you have any problem with the audio. Um, I would like to remind you that there is a chat section where you can leave your comments. And remember also that the questions section is available for any inquiry during the presentation. If you have any questions, just pop them in there and will be answered after the presentation of Alberto. Um, last, uh, let me remind you that uh, this webinar will be recorded for the purpose of sharing it uh, with you. This recorded session uh, will be available in a few days at GMB Profiles in Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube. Okay, so... Um, so, uh, you said, so probably that there are still attendees getting in, so probably at the beginning it's best that uh, <clears throat> I present GMB and myself uh, while we wait for others to join. So, many of you uh, know me probably, I'm Alberto Agueda, and I lead the space surveillance uh, and tracking, the space situational awareness and space safety activities in, in GMV. Uh, for those that do not know GMV, uh, so the, the company was created around 35 years ago as a spin off from university, yeah, having space dynamics as a cradle, but it has evolved in all these, along all these years into a large group of more than 2,200 people working on it in 11 countries. And uh, we do not only work on space, but also on IT, transportation, homeland security, and, and a large diversity of, of sectors. In my case, so on, on my uh, domain in space surveillance and tracking, we are at the moment more than 50 engineers, 5-0, working in, in six countries at the moment for a variety of applications on collision avoidance, re-entry prediction, fragmentation detection, um, cataloging of objects and so on and so forth, and the provision of these kind of services to both institutions like um, the main space agencies, mainly in Europe but also around the world, and also a large number of commercial operators. Okay, so it's already five past. I think that Tatiana, probably we can start. I guess that most of the attendees are already in. So yeah, we almost have seven seventy attendees. Okay, I think good, good. a proper number. <laughs> oh, excellent. So um, first of all, uh, well, as I said before, my name is Alberto Agueda. I manage uh, space surveillance and tracking, space situation awareness, and space safety activities in the GMB group. But this presentation has not been prepared only by my by myself, of course. Well, here you can see the list of our colleagues working on all these uh, technologies and that have been also uh, contributing to the presentation and that are doing the vast majority of the work. Um, let's get started. So um, artificial intelligence or AI is, is uh, it's, it's quite, quite a cool thing now at the moment, as cool as Internet of Things can be, Industry 4.0, blockchain, many concepts that at the moment are very um, at the edge of the technology. In my case, I'm not an AI engineer. I am not a software engineer either. I, I, I am an astrodynamics engineer. Um, and in fact, I am even an astrodynamics engineer, quite a skeptical of the use of all these new technologies to the, to the space domain. So probably uh, I could be the right person to do this kind of, of presentation because I would not be, let's say, biased by my, by my own uh, thoughts about it, okay? But what I do know is that there's a real need for automation in, in the decision-making in collision avoidance operations. So we work with a lot of operations. I will say later on, uh, we'll provide a certain list of them. And, and AI can certainly be useful for the purposes because it's being used, this technology, for many other similar cases. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I was um, tempted uh, to, to change the name of the, of the webinar from, from this towards automatic collision avoidance, making use of, of AI, to something like how to ensure satellite social distances with social distancing, sorry, with AI, by right? taking into account the these very, very strange days that, that we are that we are living. Okay, so this presentation is about, about this concept. 
So the, the, the first thing that you um, end up having when you want to do a presentation of, on, on AI are, are many pictures. Uh, I will show quite many pictures. This presentation will not be, uh, will not be very detailed. It will be a, an informa informative presentation. No equations, no covariances, probabilities of collision, complex processes, workflows, not at all. So we intend to just make a presentation of the concept as such and how AI can, can help operators to uh, automate this uh, decision-making process. So on AI, you ha end up having a lot of images in, in, in Google, like this one, and now you have to find out how to make them uh, how to make them look nice in a, in a, in a presentation, okay? Now you have to start thinking about what to tell. So first thing is, what is AI? So many of you probably know, uh, but, but AI um, seems very complex for the, for the vast majority of the people, but it, it, this is just a, a, about having a, a machine learning to do things as, as, as a human could do, more or less. We could define it in, in, in that way, okay? Which in many cases, a human does, does not do it in an intelligent manner. So but we wanted the machine to do it as a human would do it, let's say, okay? Or have certain level of, of intelligence. Um, I was saying before that I'm an astrodynamics engineer and not such a fan of AI technologies. And, and I always remember that in the good old times, engineers tried to, to model the, the, the physics and the maths governing the world. And in most cases, we used to do it with good old Fortran 77 or C code. And, and whenever you failed to do that because you could not find the right equations to do it, you, or you were too lazy probably even to, to analyze all those equations or you didn't, did not have the time to do it, then you made a Ponte Carlo analysis. Now we could now there's such a hype on AI that where you could, we could see the AI technology as, as as the next step, right? When people are too lazy to do a Monte Carlo, then they think about okay, why don't you try to do AI with this? And and and, and this is how how most of the things start. In fact, in my case, um, the first time I met uh, the AI experts in, in in GMV that work on the IT domain, nothing to do with space. They they basically do things on cyber security data analytics with with big data for banks it companies and so on and so forth they made me a presentation with many nice uh, pictures like the one i showed in the previous screen and uh, and they were explaining to me that the kind of problems they solve and i was making questions they answered and so i was somehow i'm a curious person so i was trying to find out what was behind it at some point then I, I i saw a graph and i said well but it seems that there you are making a kind of a, a linear feed to a set of data and they said, well, well, we make a linear feed in the best cases, in the best cases, in the most complex cases. So that's why AI is not, let's say, um, mathematically a, any complex concept is more a concept about training data, about having large amount of data and using it in a, in a, in a good manner, let's say. Let's first see a, a bit of, of history about AI. So AI is nothing new. So uh, in fact, the, the start of AI is considered to be in the 50s with the, with the Turing test defined by Alan Turing. For those that do not know Alan Turing, please uh, check. So he can be considered a hero from the uh, World War II. And uh, in fact, there's a movie quite famous called uh, the, the, the Imitation Game that you, you, you can see. So after that, in the 50s, 60s, uh, they started to build up the first machines, robots that we have seen in many movies as well. But then after that, all this hype that people thought that everything could be made with robots, with robots, sorry. We had a long period between the mid 60s and mid 90s, which is called the, 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 the AI winter, during which uh, there was no significant development around this technology. But after that, uh, in, in the mid 90s, they started developing a lot of technology around it, mainly around the chess and games. Like uh, probably most of you remember Deep Blue, this, this uh, computer from IBM that uh, beat um, Kasparov playing chess. And after that, many others have, have arrived, like uh, uh, AlphaGo or, or, or Alpha Zero from, from Google. And then in the, in the late 90s and beginning of 2000, we started having more and more. Um, machines working at home like uh, machines or robots like uh, this uh, Aibo from, from I think it was from uh, uh, Honda or a Japanese company and, and the Roomba used to, to clean the house and also it, later in the uh, 2010s the uh, virtual conversational assistants appeared and like uh, Siri or Alexa and in fact now they are <laughs> right too within our lives 
and, uh, and, and the next step probably is the, the, the self-driving cars, right? Now at the moment, there's a huge uh, number of developments around self-driving cars and how AI technology can support this uh, new, use, new use to support, the, the, let's say, the, the global mobility. But what is the future? So, um, so, so which are the technologies and how can they be, be, be seen from this uh, past? Um, so the, 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 what we currently know as, as AI is, is what the specialists call the artificial narrow intelligence, so ANI, that basically is the, the, the technology that is used for these Roombas, the assist, conversational assistants or self-driving cars. This is where we are at the moment, and in fact, this is where GMV is working, right? In the next two steps, I will I will make a, a bit of a of a joke with the, with the acronyms because it's quite fun to see that the next step would be the artificial general intelligence so, or AGI that uh, which also stands for analytical graphics, which are the, our our American friends and also our competitors as well, and and which which somehow represents the, the technology that would be necessary to have a computer that is as smart as a person. And we could see this, uh, well, we have already seen in movies like uh, Brave Runner or artificial intelligence, okay? And the next step for, uh, be beyond that would be the ASI. So, which is also fun, the, the, the acronym, uh, the artificial super intelligence, the ASI, which would also stand for the Agencia Spatial Italiana, that somehow are the Italians that would be the only one that could do <laughs> It even better than than the Americans. Okay, just just a joke. Sorry for that. So, which we have also seen in 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 other movies like uh, Terminator or or Matrix. Okay, and you would say, hey, but come on, Alberto. Well, this is just science fiction. Okay, this will never happen. This is just uh, in your, your, your in your in your imagination. But well, experts do not quite think so. Um, the, the 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 median expert prediction of when AI will be a reality is by 2040. And the median of the expert prediction for ASI to be a, a reality is 2060, which means that we are not too far to have a Terminator done, and, um, and which means that the, the, the future is, uh, or we can be a bit scared about, about the future if we do not control the technology we, we develop. And we have seen this in movies like Terminator, indeed. Uh, in my case, I'm quite, um, well, not too worried because probably by 2040 I will be already retired, and by 2060 I will be even dead. So now that we do know what we should not do with AI, so we're making use of this technology to to to, to create a Skynet or a Terminator, we, let, let's see what we can do with it. What we should do with it. Um, many many people are now trying to find out whether it can be used for 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 anything, and in fact there are many experts that say that AI could be. Uh, um, a game changer somehow in, 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 in engineering. But some others even think that um, more than a game changer, it could be uh, well, it doesn't work. It could be seen as a solution looking for a problem. That AI could even be at the moment a solution looking for a real for, for a problem to solve. But what experts basically say that you have to use or the the, 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 the main um, areas where uh, AI can really play a role in, in engineering needs are, are these three ones. So first is to improve existing processes, to, so to enhance the, the customer experience, so to, 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 to make our life easier, let's say, by making things that we already did in an easier manner. Well, the, the conversational assistants are a clear, uh, a clear um, example of this. So we already had a way to, to interact with our uh, smartphone, but now it's much simpler with these assistants. Second is the innovation. So to try to be to, to create new processes, new customer needs, be disruptive. And indeed, AI is a clear disruptive technology that can be used to create new uh, endeavors, new new services, new um, products. And the final one is the automation. So optimization of, of operations, of uh, routing things that we do on a daily basis. And this is, in fact, the, the reason why we are here, because we have a, pro, uh, a problem to solve. Some operations that we already do for collision avoidance in space and uh, to see how AI could support it. But before applying it to a real problem, to, to do a real project, um, first you have to make yourself three, three questions. So that they, they, all the experts say that you have to put three clear conditions on, on whether using AI to your problem or not. And, and until you don't have those three 
answers clearly stated, you could you should never start using this technology because probably you would end up being in, in, in trouble. So the first is the business value. So um, so you, you should apply AI to something, to a problem that you cannot do in a simpler manner or, or by simpler means. So for instance, in, in our case, uh, we were asked to develop an orbit propagator with AI by our, our customer that in fact knew quite much about orbit propagation. And we said, well, sorry, but no. So an orbit propagator can be easily done with uh, simple equations and which are purely deterministic. So we don't think that there's any clear advantage in doing this with AI. The, the, the second question I have to make to your service is whether this is able to execute, that is able to execute, so that it must be doable, because AI, uh, well, even if people think that AI could do anything, AI cannot do anything. And in our case, for instance, another example, which is quite, quite, quite good in this case, is the, the fact that uh, another customer asked us that they were certainly interested in having an AI system working on board a satellite that would do the role of a self-driving car so basically we have a self-driving satellite that would have some cameras to detect the space debris coming towards it and maneuver to avoid it and well yes a self-driving car could see pedestrians coming towards it at 100 kilometers per, per hour but in this case the pedestrians would be the space debris objects coming at uh, 14 kilometers per second towards you so i don't think that's quite uh, doable again and the, and the final question i have to answer is whether you have a data availability, whether whether you have a large amount of data, good, homogeneous, and well-prepared training data so that you can make your AI system learn from that data. Um, in space, in fact, uh, we normally have quite scarce data, so we, 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 it's, it's quite difficult to see a, a space application apart from Earth observation or or, or, or any others, but for space operations, we cannot talk about big data. In fact, we, we would have quite, we could still talk about scarce data because the, in, may, in many cases, um, even operators are not ready to share this data with others and they are quite reluctant to, to, to share the way they do operations. That's why the amount of data available is quite uh, scarce and in most cases, it's also very heterogeneous. That's why in many cases, we have to develop uh, what, what we call digital twins, which are basically simulators, so simulate certain real conditions and then play with them in order to uh, to have your AI system getting trained by this amount of data that you have previously uh, simulated. In fact, in the real, in outside of, of space, the, 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 the same happens. So there, there are many cases when, when AI has been used with either not enough data or with not too good data. And, and in fact, uh, they, they, in this case, when the AI system is not behaving properly, or let's say it's not uh, has not been properly trained in order to make good decisions, it's, they, 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 they are called well every now and then they talk about artificial stupidity rather than intelligence. And it's quite famous the the, the case of the racial bias, right? For instance, uh, in the US, uh, or the, there seems to be a, 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 an AI-based system called Compass that supports judges to to uh, to have a first indication of whether a, a, a person is guilty or not. And there seems to be a racial, a, a racial bias that indicates that in most occasions, a, a, a black person would be, um, uh, or would have more chances to, to be uh, guilty. And the same happens with, for instance, the gender bias. So, so in, in some companies have even established the systems based on AI to define salary increases and these, many of these systems have proved that in most cases the higher salary increases are provided to the men instead of to the women so again this depends on the data you train your system with so if we train it with historical data which is not fair or accurate you could end up having uh, let's say uh, wrong decisions uh, performed by your ai system as i said at the beginning your AI system will only behave in the same manner as a human would behave, which does not always mean that it would behave uh, or let's say, or, or make the right decisions. So what is the landscape in terms of technology? So artificial intelligence is a very generic concept uh, and, and there are many methods. I mean, in, in most cases, you, you, we should in fact talk about uh, machine learning, which could be the, the, the as, as you can see here, the resource performance improves as they are exposed to more data over time and then the deep learning, which could be a, a step further when, when there are multi-layer neural networks that learn from a vast amount of data. Um, 
but in, in any case, they all fulfill the same definition. So intelligence, autonomy, and to, to reach a, a certain goal. Okay? And there are many, many technologies and use cases. This is again a, a graph that we extracted from, from internet where you can see the many technologies that you can use and the many, many potential applications that AI technology can, can have, always supported by data science. So to exploit the data, extract the best information out of the data so that it can be then used by AI uh, systems, okay? But what, what should I apply? Let's say, what, what, what's the, 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 the actual technology that I should use if I want to use AI to my particular project? Here in this graph, we can see a, a, a qualitative um, indication of the performance or the suitability of, uh, of different AI methods from less complex to more complex, depending on the amount of data available. So as you can see, deep learning techniques are more performant when we have a large amount of data available. But what happens in space? In space, normally, as I said before, we don't have big data. We don't have a lot of data, and particularly for the, this problem of decision making for collision avoidance operations. This is why um, we consider, though, and, and we expect, uh, we expect that uh, in, in most cases for this problem, traditional machine learning would be outperforming the use of neural networks or deep learning uh, for this particular problem. And in fact, you can see, uh, the, the, again, this graph is extracted from from internet where you can see the use of machine learning and particularly the reinforcement learning. One of the main applications for it is the, the, uh, the, it's used for real-time decision-making. Okay, so which again, uh, somehow defies the, our suspicions. So, but let's go to the problem. Let's go to the collision avoidance problem. M many of you probably are from this space uh, domain and know about collision operations, but some of you probably are not. And this is somehow how, how it looks. So at, at the moment, um, most, the, 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 the most uh, reliable collision avoidance uh, services uh, are provided by the, by the US, by the 18th Space Squadron, uh, that basically are systematically observing the, the space with uh, telescopes and radars and, and maintain catalogs of uh, space debris. So what they do then, they screen the orbits of all the satellites operating around the globe, uh, or orbiting around the Earth, and uh, establish when there will be a, a potential conjunction, okay? In case there's a, a conjunction, they, they notify the, 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 the operator, well, let's see, and send a certain message uh, to, to, to it, okay? If more data is, is required, then they do it. And then there are additional services, for instance, on top of this, like those we've provided from GMV, like Focus OC, I will talk about it later on. Uh, basically, uh, the, 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 the process is, is quite, uh, it's not too complex, as you can see, and there are many tool, tools to support you, but in the end, in most cases, there are, there's a decision to be made. And in many cases, this decision has to be made in, 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 in a short period of time and with a lot of data uh, available uh, uh, on your hands, and it could end up uh, having, uh, let's say, uh, stressful situations in, in, the, in, the, in the operations room, okay, as, as you can see here. So, and the, the, the main thing here is that in most cases, in fact, that decision will depend strongly on the operator that made it, and also even on, on the person that made it. So, because depending on his mood that day, and the, his experience, and, or, and many other, uh, let's say, uh, things which are difficult to, to control. That's why we consider there's certainly a need for automation of all these uh, processes in order to have systematic decisions made. So here you can see, in fact, the process at, at the European Space Agency. This is the, 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 the official process for collision um, avoidance decision making. As you can see, it's not too complex, but at some point in most of these in many of these uh, boxes, there's a, a, maneuver pro, a, a manual process. So at some point, there's a decision to be made by a space debris analyst, and uh, then uh, always this is uh, error prone. And it, and it will become more and more complex, I would say, because at the moment, uh, in, in, in the current, uh, in the last years, we have seen uh, that, uh, like for cars, electric satellites are becoming more and more, um, are getting more, more, more and more into the market of, of space, and more and more of the new launch satellites are, are half electric propulsion. Uh, electric propulsion is, is really good, so basically it implies that you will have less um, 
less uh, fuel needed for your operations so that the, the weight of your satellite will be much lower but it has some obviously some drawbacks as for cars uh, they are not very powerful cars the electric cars as you know and the same happens with satellites so they require longer periods to to reach a target orbit for instance so you have to make a long very long uh leo period before you reach your final destination and the same happens when you need to make a a, a maneuver uh, for instance for collision avoidance they are less reactive so they require longer periods to, to to make a maneuver either for for station keeping or to avoid collisions so all these will certainly make the the, the collision avoidance operations for these kind of satellites uh, more more and more complex But not only that, the problem is that we are not launching few electric satellites. We are launching many, many, many of these electric satellites. Uh, at the moment, there are already uh, many constellations uh, working, like, well, uh, there were before the last years already working constellations like Iridium or Global Star, and there's an increasing number of mega constellations, like, for instance, OneWeb, uh, well, now probably not too trendy because they got into uh, bankruptcy a few weeks ago, but they already have 74 satellites on orbit. SpaceX, who they already have four, uh, 422 satellites on orbit, and they expect to have up to uh, 12,000. Uh, Amazon Kuiper, they expect to have more than 3,000 at 600 kilometers, and many, many more concepts are being developed. So basically, this will imply that we'll have a, a, a huge congestion, particularly in LEO, many satellites being operated, and a lot of space debris up there so that the constellations will be very, very, very complex, okay? Let's continue. And since the very beginning, uh, in, in the deployment of these constellations, you can see here, this is a, a nice view of the first launch from, from uh, Starlink uh, one year ago. And this, and this is the piece of news that was uh, provided by Space News that, that day in, in May 2019. They already talked about the capability of the Starlink constellation to perform automatic maneuvers. So, of course, people understand that at some point we will, for with these large constellations, we will need to automate these kind of of uh, of, uh, of processes and, and operations. And uh, in here, uh, is fact, uh, SpaceX or Starlink, they mentioned that this was already somehow automated. But a few months after, uh, in September, there was already a, a close conjunction between a uh, Satellite from the European Space Agency, uh, called Eolus, with a Starlink satellite, and, and there was a quite, um, let's say, um, let's not call it a fight, but certain uh, dispute on who should um, maneuver, and in the end, ISA had to maneuver to avoid a potential conjunction. And uh, to be honest, ISA was not, let's say, too too happy about it. Okay. So indeed, uh, as I mentioned, and just as, as a summary, uh, the, 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 the increasing number of objects in, in Earth's orbit um, will imply increasing number of conjunctions and the operational costs will certainly also increase. Um, we will be even operating hundreds of satellites with a huge number of collision alerts per day that will imply many, many decisions to be made. All these decisions, if we follow the current procedures, will imply a huge human effort, which will basically be undoable and unsustainable. And then it could lead to, to a large number of, of, of errors. And because obviously, anytime you put a human uh, in, in the process, this is an error prone, which could lead certainly to mistakes. So we do need automation. And in the end, we find, I found the, the, the place to put the, the, the nice image I found at the beginning. And, 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 a, and a motto somehow, like saying that a well-trained machine will certainly make mistakes, but but of course, uh, and, and, but an operator under stressful conditions will make many more than, than this machine, and they will be less systematic. Let's say. So, um, how to make it? This this would be a very very simplistic uh, representative decision tree, uh, tree, whether issuing a CDM or not issuing it, whether maneuvering or not, uh, depending on certain probability of collision, but there are many other uh, decision-making elements that need to be taken into consideration. Um, if, if we give enough input data to a machine learning algorithm, it can be trained to reproduce similar outputs as a human. So in the end, these kind of systems are like a baby that you have to um, educate. So you will, uh, a baby at the, when he's born, she's born, doesn't know that if you drop a ball, 
uh, it will fall down. And if you drop a, a glass, it will break, but it will learn it based on experience. And this is the same here. So we have to put a lot of training data to it so that it will learn whether it has to, uh, what it will have to do. And this training data would be the CDM, so uh, conjunction data messages received, so alerts, and decisions made in previous, in, 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 uh, historically. So whether based on that information on the table, we decided to maneuver or not, so that the, the machine learning algorithm could do, uh, or, or let's say replicate the same behavior in the future under similar conditions. As said before, the, typically there's quite a scarce data in, in space, and particularly in this in this uh, problem. And this is why we can see that we should always try to use additional training data by means of simulation, so that with a, what they call in the AI context a digital twin, generate many many uh, conjunctions and make decisions not under stressful situations, but with a well-trained uh, operator that could then be used for training the uh, machine learning uh, algorithm. And then this system could be somehow uh, generic, uh, as said here. So any and, and provided any, to any operator so that they could train it on, on their own flavor, in the same manner as with kids, as I said before. So if you gave the same kid to different parents, they would certainly be uh, educated, uh, or him or her, in a different manner, and the kid will be different and behave different. Same would happen with these kind of algorithms, and each operator could somehow train on its own way to make the decision that if this operator would have made. And there are many initiatives at the moment. So this is not only our, our idea, GMV's idea, but there are many, uh, many, many people behind it, and particularly the European Space Agency, uh, the last uh, Ministerial Council at the end of last year, they decided that one of the cornerstones for their space safety program would be devoted to uh, automated collision avoidance. And they call it uh, CRIM, Collision Risk Estimation and Automated Mitigation. Uh, GMV is, is uh, working already with, with ESA in, in similar activities, and in fact, we are willing also to contribute to, to, this, uh, to this new new program. But what are we doing in GMV? So um, we have been working on, on collision avoidance since, uh, well, more than 20 years ago in the late 90s, uh, and, and basically we have been part of it in, in all the four eras we could talk about in, in collision avoidance operations. Uh, the first era would be before the year 2000 when we used to work on TLEs, let's say, uh, not very accurate orbital information, and only able to compute missed distances. No? We didn't have information of covariances so that we could not compute probability of collision. Um, and in, in that period, we already worked for ESA, developing the, the main systems that ESA has for collision risk assessment, like CRAS, and also for um, orbit determination and, and cataloging like Odin and, and DISCOS. And then in the second area, the, we started using the CDMs and we developed our own technology called uh, Close Up and that started being used uh, along the years by a large number of operators and uh, using uh, the CDMs. So the, the, these alerts that I mentioned before uh, from uh, the 18th Space Squadron in the US New Space Force. And uh, now we have even uh, in the, in the recent years, we have evolved it in order to be able to also obtain information directly from the US, the SP precise catalog, so that we can uh, post process and have the same accurate info catalog information from, from the US uh, so that we can provide our own services. And this is our Focus OC uh, operations uh, center that already provides collision avoidance uh, services to more than 10 satellite, uh, to, to more than 10 operators. Uh, and more than 80 satellites all in all. And the next step is Auto CA, which is a new concept we are developing now to uh, automate all these operations, making use of uh, collision uh, of, of artificial intelligence, sorry, mainly applicable to uh, electric satellites and, and large constellations that will be uh, part of the, of the new era starting uh, now, probably, which is called the space traffic management. We, we want to try to support the space traffic management operations in, in, in the future. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you all for your attendance. And, and as uh, Tatiana mentioned at the beginning, if, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer to it. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. So as Alberto said, and now we open the floor to questions. Um, Alberto, if you wish, we we'll start with uh, the first uh, question. Uh, Victoria asks, 
you what is the background of GMB regarding artificial intelligence and the project that GMB is working on currently? Oh, okay, well, I introduced it uh, slightly yes. in, in this previous uh, slide. Uh, so Maybe you can focus on, me, on the yeah, I can, I can, I can, yeah, I can give a bit more of, of, of details, let's say. Uh, so, um, so GMB, as I said at the very beginning, we, we don't only work on uh, in the space business. So we have a, a branch of the company working in the IT sector, and they do a lot of work on big data and data analytics, uh, for mainly for um, anti-fraud operations or cyber security. Uh, they started using AI, well, um, quite many years ago. And in our case, in the space domain, we have exploited this, the, the, their, their experience and, and all these synergies in order to, uh, to use it for, mainly for, for defense and, and space applications. In, in space, uh, we are now applying this technology in, in a large number of scenarios, and I can probably um, highlight the use of it for, for Earth observation applications, for so image processing and the, and, and the uh, provision of, of detailed services uh, out of it. Um, another use is, is um, robotics, so on, on board uh, software for automation of operations on board satellites and for robotics. So, and we are running projects with ISA for the definition of how uh, AI techniques can, can support this, this, um, this automation on board and all the avionics on board. And then more related to the presentation today uh, is, um, is operations. So we are also making use of artificial intelligence to, to, to automate operations. And, and, and we are running, a, for instance, a, a project to, to, with, with ISA as well to analyze how to apply machine learning to, to in the field of satellite communication, so to how to automate satellite communications operations, and also in Galileo to to, uh, to evaluate how AI technology can be used to to um, uh, let's say uh, enhance or, or improve the operations of Galileo for its second generation, and then we have AutoCA, which is this this uh, project I mentioned here which is, again, a project with, with the European Space Agency for the development of a prototype of, uh, of what we presented today, a system that could perform collision avoidance decision making, making use of artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. Okay, we have uh, another question related <laughs> about the, the, the details you have uh, tell us. Andre asks uh, if our artificial intelligence projects already apply in collision avoidance demonstrator, demonstrator, sorry, a GMB, ISA, or others entities. So as uh, I said, so uh, th 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 there are quite many initiatives, but for particularly for collision avoidance in, in in Europe, we are not aware of any real, let's say operational system based on AI that could do collision avoidance operations. So what we are developing at the moment for ISA is uh, a prototype that could be used for large constellations or electric satellites, and it will be uh, ready for its use, uh, well, early this year uh, or at the beginning, of, or at the beginning of, of last year. Um, but at the moment, we are not aware of any satellite that is doing these uh, kind of operations, making use of artificial intelligence only. There are plans in ISA, indeed, to uh, have uh, this technology also used in as part of their uh, in-orbit demonstration missions. So in the future, there will be some very small mission for every demonstration to test and prove how this technology can be, can be used. Okay, we have another question from Pavlina. She asked, uh, what position data is FocusSoc using? What? Sorry, say again. Position what? data? Yes. Position data is FocusSoc, the GMB product, FocusSoc using. Yeah, FocusOC is making use of the precise catalog from the 18th Space Squadron, so from what we used to call JSPOC, so from the American. Uh, from the American uh, Air Force, and we access it on a daily basis, post-process it, so that we can provide uh, enhanced services to our customers. And as I said before, there are already more than 10 satellite operators and more than 80 satellites uh, making their 24 by 7 operations with our services and making their decisions on whether maneuvering or not 
with the information that we provide to them. Okay, uh, we have enough time, yes. Uh, Erika also asked uh, if, uh, have you estimated the impact of so many constellations from collision risk? So, in fact, we are working on activity to do that at the moment, and there are quite many initiatives. I, uh, I know about uh, one in the University of Texas, I think, that they have been evaluating the collision uh, risk within a constellation and the risk of collision that the constellation could or each of the satellites of a constellation would have with the all the amount of space debris at the moment in, in, in Leo. So we have not made any detailed uh, assessment of it, but there are quite many uh, studies or, that have already been performed. And of, and of course, the, the, the risk is uh, rapidly increasing as, as long as all those constellations that, uh, that I showed in, in a video uh, will be deployed if they are deployed. Okay, we have another question. Uh, Carlos uh, asked about how much time uh, do you have since the warning signal is triggered and the maneuver has to be performed? Well, and it depends. Also, the, the question continues and yeah. uh, he asked if, is it enough to consider field optimization uh, to plan the maneuver? Well, it depends. It depends. It depends a lot on the, on the problem. So in some cases, uh, we have received uh, warnings with few hours in advance, which basically implies that we don't have much time to make a, a decision. And, and it's not only this. So the, the, you need not only the time to make a decision, but also the time to send this decision to the satellite. And in fact, the Independent Space Agency is also working not only on this process to, to automate this decision making and, and make it more efficient and more sim, uh, systematic, but uh, also to enhance the means to provide this information to the satellite that it has to maneuver by sending it through other links like, I don't know, through the, the Galileo signal or by, by any other means because you have to take into account that not all satellites are continuously uh, reachable by the ground segment so that we could not send these decisions to the satellite so that it could perform a, a collision avoidance maneuver. Um, and regarding the second question, uh, or well, I still continue with the first question. In fact, the, 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 the services that we provide to our customers tend to enlarge this time period. So what we try is to uh, provide any conjunction alert to our customers, to the operators, well in advance so that they have a lot of time to decide whether they want to maneuver or not. In most cases, it's more important that you know well in advance that you have a, a risk of collision, even if it is not too high, rather than being very, very aware that it's a very high risk of collision, but with a sh very short time to react. So this is why we warn them with few days in advance so that they can take their time to uh, make the decision and optimize this maneuver. And this links to your second question, which is this, uh, optimization that you mentioned, the fuel optimization to plan the maneuver. Indeed, this depends a lot on the, on, on the operator. So uh, in, in, in the more time you have, of course, the most um, uh, detailed assessment that you can perform and the most uh, effective maneuver, uh, avoidance maneuver you can perform. Uh, in some cases, there's no time to do this uh, optimization. And then you have to basically trigger a default, a maneuver by default to get out of the curse of the uh, of the object that that will that is well is uh, suitable to collide with you okay and and uh, yeah that, well that, that that's it so basically that the, that's the main problem more than even the accuracy of the information for for whether making a decision or not is the timeliness of that information is how much time do i have to react okay okay adam also asked uh, about if uh, do you have a field or if an AI-based CA decision maker could really be much better than something simpler, like just basing maneuver decisions on using weighting factors of CD, CD and box, miss distance, num of ops of each object, TCA, etc. <laughs> yeah, well, um, depends. If you see this definition of artificial intelligence, we could see that a, a, a software putting weights and making those decisions based on certain algorithms could also be considered as as as, as AI. 
the good thing in AI is that it would not be somehow hard coded, the, the, all these algorithms, and they would be more flexible so that the system could be trained in the flavor the operator wants to. That, does it mean that it will make it better? Probably not. But the, the good thing is that you could then have a system that could be used by a large amount of, of operators in different manners on their own way so that they could train it on their own way and based on their own experience so that they have the system behaving how they want to they want it to behave and in fact you could train this ai system with decisions made with deterministic uh, algorithms as you say so you could use those systems to train then an ai system that would then provide those those flexible operations okay uh, we have uh, another question from Andre. What data can be used to train AI? For instance, how is data sourced internationally from different sensor operators? And regarding data from G GSPOC, does GMB have access to more data than available from public at space track? So, first question, uh, the, the, the kind of data basically are decisions, so are the CDMs for this particular problem, okay? So, for this particular problem, are the, 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 the conjunction warnings, so CDMs that you have to then uh, use in order to uh, train the system. And not only that, the decision that based on that CDM and a certain um, ancillary information, uh, that is used by the operator to make up the decision. So, all that data will have to be used and the decision made in order made in order to uh, train the AI system. And then for the second question, wh whether we have access to more data than the one publicly available in, in space track, yes. So we at DMV, we have an SSA sharing agreement with the, with the US Stratcom so that we can access the, the precise catalog, the whole uh, precise catalog for all uh, unclassified objects in the, in the US catalog. In the, in the, for general purposes, you can only have access to the TLEs or to your own CDMs. In our case, we can access the CDMs of the operators we provide support to, and also the precise SP catalog with all the, let's say, latest orbital information available for the all unclassified objects, including uh, the, the, the vast majority of, 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 of the catalog uh, space debris objects. Okay, we have another question from Pedro. Considering projections on number of collision avoidance maneuvers in LEO uh, with all new mega constellation on the pipeline, could operational reaction times for final CAM's decision to be reduced somehow? E, well, the, 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 the reaction time probably e Yes, so basically the intention is to automate all these operations. So then the reaction time will be very, very short. At some point when, when you are now put in a decision made by a human ability that, that implies higher latencies or more timeliness on your, on, your, on your processes. If you automate this fully the system and you basically let the machine make the decisions and command the satellite to make or not a maneuver, then obviously all, all these, this, the, although that time will be uh, extremely um, reduced, and and then all the operations will be much more, much more efficient from the point of view of the time spent to 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 make them. Okay, one one more question. We have enough time. Yes, uh, from you. Do you think at any time in the future? that AA could be implementing on board and make satellites somehow autonomous? This would reduce response times if traffic gets denser in the future, also goodness. Yeah, I, I mentioned a, a, a case, so I mentioned one of the cases that is that's quite science fiction, that a satellite would make decision on its own data, so that it would have a camera here and there, like a self-driving car, to detect a Piece of space that be coming towards it and then avoid it making a maneuver that's obviously not not possible because well as i said so pieces of space debris can come towards you at 14 kilometers per second so it would be impossible to do it but indeed we could upload to the satellite a certain information on the status of the objects around it so that the satellite could make the decision on its own whether it has to maneuver or not to avoid colliding with one of the objects that that is around it so we would provide it with the information of the surrounding information uh, or population uh, 
uh, around him, around it, sorry, around the satellite, so that it could uh, then uh, decide whether malware or not on an autonomous manner. Basically, bringing all these uh, technology algorithms that we are now uh, testing and proving on ground, bringing it on board. But not only that, also the information of the orbital orbits, let's say, or the or, uh, orbital evolution of the different objects uh, around it. Okay, we have another question from Mihai. Which sort of learning do you use in the training of the AI? So I'm, I'm not quite quite an expert on the on the on the details, uh, but we are at the moment uh, making use of several several uh, technologies for on, on machine learning. Uh, LS, LSM, for instance, is being used and a few others. Uh, but again, uh, at the moment, uh, the, this is uh, we are working on the definition of the technology that will be used for it. And as I said, LSM is one of the techniques, but there are many others that have been that has been applied and used. Okay, we have. In the case, in any case if, you are, if you are interested on the details, you can contact us, of course, and we can provide you more details. We don't want this uh, this presentation to be detailed from the let's say from the technical point of view. But if you are interested, feel free to go contact us, and we can provide you with more details. Sir, sure. I said there there are four uh, three more questions. Uh, one from Antonio. Uh, currently, which errors are being considered in satellite position and velocity for our, for collision avoidance maneuvers? Well, well errors. So the, the, the typical accuracy is in the in the catalog um, from from the US uh, could be considered in the order of well, let's say tens to hundreds of meters in in, in Leo, up to um, hundreds of meters and. and or kilometers in in geo that will be the the order of magnitude but this depends a lot on the quality of the data used uh, how many sensors could track the that particular object in the previous days so that the orbital uh, orbit mission uh, solution was more or less accurate so it depends a lot but th those figures can be taken as, as a good reference Okay, um, also Francois asked you if do you consider onboard EA COLA method from autonomous orbit control coupled? Coupling? Yeah, this is what I, uh, that, that, that's more or less answered before, but just to, to stress mm. that the same technology developed on ground can be brought uh, on board if also the system is given the, the, um, the, 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 the right information. So, uh, the, for sure, a satellite will never be able to work as a self driving car that could have some cameras and detect the the, the, the spider will coming towards it in, in real time and making decisions. That will never happen. But uh, if you provide the information, the surrounding objects to it, then it could make its own decisions uh, on, autonomously on board uh, in the same manner as the satellites already make many, many operations autonomously on board for, uh, I don't know, for instance, for um, attitude control, for instance, okay, or going to safe mode. There are many, many decisions made on board autonomously, and this could be uh, one more in the future, yes. Okay, and, and the last questions for the time being from Angelo. Could this data from AI also be used on board for rendezvous and docking names, for instance, on orbit service on orbit service purpose? Yes, but I would say that this is a completely different story because uh, in, in this case, in fact, the, the amount of data to, to train would be even more, more scarce. Um, but in my opinion, so for, for this kind of uh, operations, probably it's more interesting to apply the, this technology to the image processing. So to, in order to have a certain, uh, not for decision making, but more for image processing, to identify what different objects are and how to get close to, for, from one to another, and then make this uh, rendezvous and, um, and then, uh, an active debris removal uh, operations more, more, more efficient. Indeed, it could be used, but uh, it could be a completely different story to what we were presenting today. So, for instance, one of the things additionally that we have, you have to make before being able to um, to get attached to a big satellite is analyzing it. And one of the things they are working on at the moment is uh, processing images from um, from uh, optical sensors or radars in order to identify how the the object is tumbling and, and you can use all uh, AI techniques 
to identify how that object is tumbling and what we can uh, and the shape of it and so on and so forth. So uh, yes, it can be used AI for sure, but in a completely different flavor. Okay, thank you, Alberto. And if there is no more questions, uh, therefore uh, we are going to close the session. I don't know, Alberto, you want to add something or? No, just to thank everyone for for attending the webinar. Uh, there was a huge audience, so I hope you enjoyed it and yeah. you found it uh, helpful for your for your work. Let me also wish that you are all safe and healthy in these very very strange days, as I mentioned at the beginning. And, uh, and we expect to make some some more webinars like this one. I hope I, I think that we will send a survey, right, uh, Tatiana, so that you can you can. Mm -hmm. uh, indicate your, your whether it was uh, useful for you so that uh, we can then decide whether making some more if you found, found it uh, useful, okay? Okay, well, from my part, if you have missed something of the webinar, don't worry, remember that the, the whole session uh, will be available in a few days in Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube, uh, GMB profiles. And um, well, we want to thank you for taking time out and be here today with us. Um, we hope uh, you enjoy our webinar and we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much.